I'm Chanel Tewalt. I'm the director of the Idaho State Department of Agriculture. So what are you guys out here doing? So we are here on the Twin Falls Reservoir, right above the Twin Falls Dam, doing the quagga mussel treatment here in 2024. Um, this is uh, an extension of the important work that we did on the river last year. Um, this is not a part of the river that we treated though because there was no villager detections here in 2023 despite extensive sampling. Um, but we are here to finish this important work. Okay, can you tell me a little bit more why this is necessary? What sort of, what the, yeah. what was detected, what this treatment is supposed to do about it? Yeah, and I would tell you a little bit about quagga mussels first. Um, the species is really hard to talk about in some ways. It's not the same as, as your viewers looking out the window and seeing a fire or seeing a flood. Um, but by the time we would know and you would visually be able to see an infestation, it's too far gone at that point. By the time we felt the repercussions, we can no longer treat. And so we are trying to treat before that point. Um, but it is hard because you're talking about a species that reproduces at a microscopic level. And that's when we can really eradicate. That's when our best chances are. But it's, it is hard to see. And so what quagga mussels are, can do, they're incredibly persistent and prolific. They're really, really good at creating monocultures and ecosystems. So they're filter feeders, they take out everything good and they leave very little for other species. And so there's a huge impact on fish species. But in Idaho, we're really focused on the impact they would have for irrigation and power generation. So quagga mussels attached to any hard substrate, to the river bottom, to turbines, to irrigation pipes, and they choke down an irrigation pipe almost to a trickle. So if you can imagine how hard it is for farmers and ranchers to do their job normally, Think about the complications in a state that depends on irrigation if we can't get irrigation water through a line. If we can't get power through our power generation facilities, we have a problem for every ratepayer in Idaho, every irrigator, every recreator. There is an enormous impact for a species that starts off really tiny and then takes over an ecosystem. Do we know how those little tiny larvae got out here? So it's impossible to tell with certainty. What we know for certain is that you would have water and villagers transported from an infested water body. So a place like Lake Mead, like Havasu, where there is an infestation that has gone uncontrolled. And so we have, whether it was somebody in Idaho bringing a boat home or was someone coming to visit us, the introduction happens through villager or muscle introduction through water um, or through attach, you know, a, a muscle attaching to a boat and then coming home and uh, finding a place in one of our water bodies, which is why we've run water body and watercraft inspe inspection stations for uh, so many years. And we've that program has gone really successfully. Most folks don't know that we also do an immense amount of water sampling and have statewide for years and years and years. And the reason that you don't know we did it is because we never found anything until we did. And the reason we do that detection constantly statewide throughout the summer is so that we can have a rapid response. Early detection and rapid response is the only way that you can work towards eradicating an invasive species. Yeah, you guys uh, really sprung into action quickly when it was detected. Can you kind of walk me through help lay us lay us through the kind of the timeline of from that first detection through the off season to today kind of help yeah. you catch us up there? well i would i would tell you in 2023 when he had our detection and we'll walk through from there um moving from detection to a, deploying a response like this is an incredibly complex system you have to work through an enormous amount of jurisdictional um you know, red tape in a sense, and also work with all the impacted stakeholders in this area. And so that is a really complex process. And to give you an idea, in Colorado, from the time of detect detection of quagga mussels in a lake to the time of treatment was about six months. Idaho did that in two weeks. That is a, an incredible pace to keep up, though, and an incredible project to try to pull off. And so we, we did that in 2023 in, in two weeks uh, with a lot of help, though. A ton of partners, whether it was Fish and Game, uh, Department of Water Resources, Department of Parks and Recreation, um, Fish and Game, I mentioned Fish and Game, but all of those partners and those state uh, agencies came to bear their, their expertise and their patience and their assistance to us to pull off something that seemed impossible. And Idaho Power was an incredible partner, local jurisdictions, all of those folks in 2023. We did something that was bigger and more expansive than anything anyone has ever attempted in North America. That was the 2023 project. And what we're doing in 2024 is even bigger than that. In the meantime, though, we've done an immense amount of sampling. And so it's a, it's a tricky thing. Again, getting back to quagga mussels and how physiologically challenging they can be to detect. We have been sampling this stretch of the river extensively since the water was warm enough to get out here. So we have not rested on our laurels since that treatment in 2023. We've been looking and looking and looking, but because we must have such a small population, they don't reproduce all the time. They like the water to be warm. And if it's a tiny population, you have to do constant monitoring to find them. So physiologically, it tells us that we're not dealing with a very big population. 
but even one villager is, is too many. It's, it, we can't deal with that. And so um, we are going to launch the biggest and most aggressive treatment of its kind ever attempted in North America. Can you tell me about this treatment? What uh, mm -hmm. the mechanisms it works through and what do we know about its impact on the environment beyond just the muscles that are being targeted? Yeah, so when we're, when we're talking about an eradication program like this, what we do as an agency is send out an all call to anybody that has a tool that they think could help us on the river. So we don't go and just uh, in a silo to determine what kind of product we're going to use for this treatment. We, we like folks to come and give us a pitch about they think this product's going to work and here's the reasons why. And then we vet those systems or the, vet those tools and to see what we can deploy safely and legally and at a rate that we think is going to be effective and lethal to muscles. And that's how we ended up on a product called Natrix. And we're really open about the product we're using. We post the label on our website for anyone who wants to see it and the rate we're applying it at. Um, it is a copper-based product, but importantly, it's a chelated copper rather than copper sulfate. Most folks in agriculture use copper sulfate all the time. Copper sulfate can react really quickly with the pH and the salinity of the Snake River. That's our anticipation, is that it would react too quickly to be effective. And mussels are really good at closing, closing up and protecting themselves against treatment. So if you have a treatment that reacts too quickly and is no longer bioavailable bio for a very long time, mussels are going to try to protect themselves. What we need is a product that can safely sit in the water for an extended period of time to the point where the respiration is going to occur and that's when that targeted treatment is going to affect them. Uh, chelated copper or copper products pass over the gills of mussels and unfortunately fish as well and interfere with respiration and that's the, that's the point where we have mortality in mussels but we need to have a really long treatment to do that and that is an incredibly complex operation. So what we have going on behind us is constant staging and moving and metering of of this product and it is not something where you set out a, a product tote on the river and just turn on a valve. This is an immensely complex stretch of the river in terms of the bathymetry, the pH, the salinity, all of those things. And so we do everything from deep water trenching of the product into the water to meter valves. We have product running through actually the power plants and the turbines over falls so we have that churning action. And we do a huge amount of monitoring on the river. So we are constantly out here, whether it's on a boat, on a kayak, any place where we can get to the river to measure and make sure that the copper is meeting the level that we need it to. So we need the threshold to be there for mortality in the mussels, but we also can't go over that because that's the safety of the product. And so it is an incredibly fine balancing act to meter and to adjust and to make sure that the river at all levels is responding the way that we need it to. Any long-term effects of the chemical or the treatment that's being done that we yeah. should be aware of. So Natrix is a copper-based product. So we're talking about chelated copper. Copper obviously is a naturally occurring element in, in the environment. And what we do ahead of time, we work with the Department of Environmental Resources to gather copper uh, background levels before we start this treatment. So whether it's here in the Twin Falls Reservoir, all the way down river, um, really to Thousand Springs to understand copper levels throughout the river. And so we know the impact that we're gonna have on the river. Um, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, there is an immense amount of organic material in this stretch of the Snake River. And what will happen is you have absorption of the, of the product into organic material. And after we get to Centennial Park, which is the end of our treatment zone, you have a huge amount of natural inflow. So those things work in our favor to have a, a, a significant amount of dissipation, what we call a dissipation zone. And so by the time we get a cup, you know, a few miles downriver of that active treatment, we have already begun a significant amount of dissipation of product of, of that copper. And again, it is a naturally occurring element. So at some point we get back to something that looks like a background level. We are doing a lot of monitoring on this though, not just uh, at the active treatment to make sure we're being effective, but downriver to make sure we're not having unintended consequences. There are our species that we are concerned about downriver, you know, as we get towards Hagerman, we want to make sure that there's no impact to those. So we also have some mitigation strategies in place that if we get past the Highway 46 bridge, that we can deploy um, and down to the rapids there, we could deploy what are called biochar wattles, which are, they have the ability to soak up some of that extra copper if we get to that point, but we never had anything close to that last year and we're expecting a fairly similar dissipation. The 2024 treatment is going to take place from Sageview, which is about two and a half miles downriver of the Hanson Bridge. That's our starting point. And then we're going to come through the Twin Falls Reservoir up to the Twin Falls Dam. That's kind of our first pool. Then from Twin Falls Dam to Shoshone Falls, that's our second area. Shoshone Falls to Pillar Falls is the third. And then from Pillar Falls to Centennial Park is the end of our treatment zone. So that is the extent of the river that we are treating. And then we'd expect, as I mentioned, the dissipation zone down to about the Highway 46 Bridge. Is that area closed off to boaters as well? 
So we worked really hard this year between the 2023 treatment and 2024 to open up as much of the river as we safely could, meaning that we could get boats washed, that we weren't going to cause undue impact to irrigators or to others who felt like there was still a risk on the river. And so we got Centennial to a point where we could open up a hot wash and work tan and glove with the county. Incredibly grateful for the interactions with Twin Falls County on that because that is their park and to get boats washed. So we have that open for the season. It is closed temporarily as we go through the copper treatment, although there are no restrictions on um, using water during the copper treatment out of an abundance of caution and for the safety of deploying the chemical and getting employees and the contractors moved around. It is temporarily closed, but that is a, a, a fairly short duration. And then we'd expect to get Centennial uh, back open. So as you mentioned from last year to this year, it's an expanded treatment area. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me about um, some of the new challenges that come with treating a new part of the river? Yeah, so every part of this river is uh, complex and has its own dynamics that I think viewers can appreciate if they've spent time down here. What we're dealing with in the Twin Falls Reservoir specifically, as you get towards um, the Sage View area, so the top of our treatment zone, is it begins to look a lot like Pillar Falls does. And so for anyone who vi visually has laid eyes on Pillar Falls to know how complex it is with deep pools and moving water, um, it looks a lot like that at the Sage View site except underwater. And so we know that we have significant challenges in terms of the movement of water and flow and to just get into every place where we could have um, where we could have mussels and that is hugely challenging and then also again the chemistry and the depth of the water is been has been very difficult and we have a lot of tools but we also have an immense amount of help we have so many agencies and I think there is um, a concern sometimes and a concern that I share that government doesn't move fast enough when there's a, when there's an issue and I think on this project they're, we're rewriting that story, that we have so much help, but also at a pace that is really unprecedented. Every natural resource agency in the state of Idaho, um, when we notified the governor that we had this problem this year, those agencies were mobilized in a matter of hours, not in a matter of days, not in a matter of weeks, in a matter of hours to give us every ounce of help. Their best and brightest people are out here on the water to help us determine bathymetry, water flow, chemistries, all of those things so that we make the best decisions. It's not ISDA in a silo doing this. We have really the best team around us. Is um, this what you're doing today? Is this kind of the plan in perpetuity moving forward? Detect muscles somewhere treat that stretch of the river and hope for the best? Or are there other uh, contingency plans in the toolbox? Yeah, so Idaho law calls us as an agency to go and monitor and respond to infestations of invasive species. And it's not just quagga mussels, it's other things. Of course, this is our highest priority right now. But the plan for those types of eradication programs doesn't look the same. What we have been able to implement here on the Snake River is incredibly aggressive. But we also know that it can't be deployed everywhere because of any number of concerns, because of drinking water, because of species of concern, we don't assume that what we're doing here is deployable maybe anywhere else in the state, maybe anywhere else in the country, um, but it is here. And so we are pulling out all the stops. We're using every tool possible here on the Mid Snake to control this infestation. We don't know that that's an option in every water body in Idaho. And it's why we always reinforce the mantra of clean, drain, dry, that what we're doing here is a last resort. It is not something that any one of us take comfort in. We're doing it because we have to to save the river, but we want everyone to make sure that they're not inadvertently moving invasive species from one place to another. So if you've been at Lake Mead or you've been at Lake Havasu, to come get a hot wash, no questions asked, to make sure that you're not hauling ballast water, to make sure you always clean every kayak, raft, boat, all of those things, that remains even more important than it's always been. We, we kind of talked about it a little bit, how this is not possible on other stretches of the uh, the snake or of other water bodies in the state. Can you tell me a little bit more about um, those other concerns in other areas? Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned like drinking water and species, but could we get a little bit more in depth there? Yeah, so if we were talking about water bodies up north specifically, I mean, we have lakes in North Idaho that are so deep that it would be physically impractical or impossible to treat. You simply couldn't get enough product to make a treatment there. That's where we have to protect that precious water body. There's also other water bodies in the state that have species of concern or endangered species where we know that we wouldn't necessarily be allowed to make a treatment like this because of those sensitive species. And so we have to be extremely careful always. And the other part of this 
is that ISDA, this community, no one wants this to happen again. Nobody wants to go through this treatment again. We know that the Twin Falls and Jerome communities have really borne the brunt of what this looks like in terms of whether it's the inconvenience of it or, or not being able to come in the water or all of those things. Nobody wants this for any other part of the state, but there are also uh, things that make it truly impractical. Can Idahoans, uh, you know, we're used to boat check stations and, yeah. and this type of thing. Should we expect these screening efforts to ramp up or to be ratchet or to be increased now that we know for sure we've detected villagers in the state? Yeah, so thanks to the Idaho legislature, the governor, um, we actually were able to strengthen the invasive species law this year in ways that hopefully it's a, it's a fine balancing act. You don't want to make it so onerous on the public that they don't want to work with the program, but in ways that are still effective. And so we have what we would call a pull the plug measure now. So you legally cannot haul ballast water in the state of Idaho. So if you're coming, even if it's a water body in state or it's a water body out of state, to, to pull the drain on those water bodies before you ever leave, and to make sure you're not hauling that to Idaho. That's a, that's a, that's a new addition. And for all water, out of state watercraft, it's not that you just have to stop at a station if you, buy, if you pass by it. It is a requirement that if you are coming to Idaho, you have to wash your boat. Um, we talked about your collaboration with DEQ. We talked about collaboration with Fish and Game. Um, are there any concerns about uh, things like tourism impacts for the state? Yeah, there's absolutely some tourism impacts that we're cognizant of, and I, I think that's where we come down to the, the message that we shared, that if we don't treat this part of the river, we lose the whole thing. So this is a very hard dose of medicine to take. Um, and it's been hard again on, the, on these communities that we know Shoshone Falls isn't just famous in the U.S., it's internationally famous. It is a place that people want to see and experience firsthand. And um, this treatment in the species has an impact on whether or not the community gets to share in the water that they love. And so we want to, as much as possible, get this treatment done and get people back to normality, really. For the 2024 treatment and in 2023, we have really a three-legged stool approach to a treatment this complex. You, you just can't have one agency or one group collaborating on it. And so here on the river actively for this 10-day treatment, we have a, a contractor that we work with called Clean Lakes. Clean Lakes has actually worked with us a, a lot in North Idaho at Bear Lake. Um, they are a company that specializes in um, challenging aquatic treatments for noxious weeds typically and invasive species. And so we are working with them. So you have ISDA and Clean Lakes and then also a company called Seapro and they're the manufacturer of Natrix. They have sent us their best and brightest. So they have their PhDs on the water with us to make sure that this product that they know better than anybody is doing exactly what we hope it's gonna do. And that again, takes constant monitoring and adjusting. So you have three entities here on the water working seamlessly, building redundancy with each other to make sure that we have the most aggressive and most successful treatment we can. Okay. Um, in, before the camera was rolling, you mentioned that this is a super aggressive treatment plan, mm -hmm. more aggressive than some other states have tried. Um, can you talk to me more about that and how Idaho is unique among the states where this has happened? We are, and I think only in Idaho could you have something with this amount of collaboration among state agencies. This is, we're very fortunate to have a small government in, impact and small government footprint that can work together when an emergency hits. Not every state is like that, we know that. But also in terms of the speed that we're expected to move in, that we have a, a government uh, culture here that is expected to move at the speed of problems and not at the speed of bureaucracy. And I think that that is, again, unique to Idaho, but we have examples in other states where in Colorado, where they found uh, mussels in a, in a lake, it took them from the time of detection to the time of treatment, it took about six months. Idaho did that process in two weeks. Um, but that doesn't mean we cut any corners either. We have to go through all the jurisdictional steps. We have to make sure we're doing this appropriately and aggressively and comprehensively. Otherwise, it, it doesn't matter. But we know that for every day that goes by, the more the species causes problems. And so time is of the essence. It is incumbent to us to move quickly, but to move with everyone pulling in the same direction. And I truly think only in Idaho would that be possible. Um, one more question for you. Why is this, of course it's a very collaborative project, but why is this housed in your department, agriculture, mm -hmm. and not something like fish and game natural resources? Yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons behind it. So if you go back to the, the early days of when the program was established, there, there are several com conversations that happened, I think, about where this program was going to live and how it makes sense. But I, importantly, and, and maybe ask Fish and Game, because I think they would have a, a more insightful answer for you, but in Idaho, the Department of Fish and Game is a dedicated fund agency entirely. 
this program is not. And so that would be anomalous for them to have a program like this housed in an agency that is otherwise solely dedicated funding. And, um, and ISDA was also poised to take on the work and we, we went from uh, passing this legislation during the session to deploying watercraft stations that summer. So again, it was one of those times when we had to move incredibly quickly. I mean, we have employees out here working 20 hour days. I'm sad to say that I'm, I know folks are exhausted, but it's truly what it takes to pull off something like this. And we have extremely talented team members, not just folks who are experts in the, the biology of mussels, but who are also divers and expert boat captains and experts in chemical treatments and experts in all of these things ready to deploy as quickly as we can. Um, but if we didn't have that team at ISDA, that, that core group that cares so much about this, this treatment and so much about the success of this program, we couldn't pull off a project like this. Union Pacific Railroad, serving Idaho for more than 160 years. A proud partner of Idaho Public Television. Presentation of Idaho Reports on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.